Right, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to DIS. It's great to see uh, such a large turnout. Um, it's an important time, of course, and uh, uh, for China, facing uh, coronavirus at the moment, which is in the news uh, quite frequently the last couple of weeks. And today we want to uh, look uh, a little bit towards the future and what is in store for Europe-China relations. Um, if we jump back to the past a little bit, um, 1926, Mao Zedong, China's, uh, the People's Republic of China's founder, wrote, who are, our, who are our enemies? Who are our friends? This is the question of the first importance for the revolution. He wrote this shortly before the Chinese Civil War, and he argued that other revolutions in China struggled to be successful because they did fail to unite real friends in order to attack real enemies. As we know, Mao's tactics were successful. Um, the Chinese Communist Party won the war against the nationalist Kuomintang, and China went on to transform itself from a very impoverished country to the global power it is today. Now, in Europe today, we're asking similar questions about China. What, is China a friend? Is China an enemy? Uh, last March, the European Union released a uh, strategic outlook that, although stated it wants to promote common interests with China, that it also viewed China as an uh, econ economic competitor and a systematic rival. China is then both a partner and competitor in, an in international trade. It's a teammate to tackle global issues such as climate change, but it's also a one-party authoritarian state that is a rival to many European values in global governance. So for Europe, China is both an enemy and a friend at once. And for many, respe for many respects, I think this strategic outlook is, is reflective of the diverse views that, uh, that exist in Europe across the European Union on China. Some European politicians, even particularly here in Denmark, I should say, are, are worried about Chinese influence on European political values. Some European businessmen are worried about Chinese competition and the state-backed support uh, in subsidies and other favoritisms that they receive from Beijing. But one, question, one can question whether these critical perspectives are neglecting avenues of cooperation with China. Then there's the other side of the coin, those that in Europe who feel China is somehow being mistreated. Uh, they bristle with anger, they fume with contempt whenever they hear critique on China. They tend to look past China's present human rights abuses and interferences, and they point to American wrongdoing, the policy of Donald Trump instead. They point to that as the larger problem, and they somehow don't recognize that we might face two problems at once here in Europe from both China and the United States. So one can question whether they are turning a blind, blind eye to the strategic intentions of China that may actually undermine European interests and values. And in Denmark, we're, we're witnessing growing tensions in the Danish-Chinese relationship of late. Um, we scheduled this event for last December, but needed to move it, and the news uh, on China kept uh, on the front page in Denmark, regardless of what we did. Um, the relationship was really once viewed as, as exclusively about trade uh, and investment, and it's now become more nuanced and complicated. We've seen regular attempts by uh, China and the Chinese embassy here in Copenhagen to control dialogue and debate on China in Denmark, challenging political values that many Danes hold dear, and seeking to fuel division within Danish society, seeking to divide Danes between friends and enemies. And China has been successful at times. Uh, in 2012, Danish protesters were detained by police in the streets of Copenhagen uh, when Hu Jintao, the former Chinese president, was visiting. At other times, however, China's influence and demands uh, fall on fail. Uh, most recently, this came after the Chinese embassy demanded Yulan's Post and, and cartoonist Niels Bo Boyesen reproach themselves and a publicly apologize to the Chinese people for linking the Kenora virus with the Chinese flag. Where economic interests are concerned, Danish companies are still very much attracted to the Chinese marketplace and will remain so. 
Um, but they're also concerned about Chinese competition, not only in China, but increasingly around the world and here in Europe. Dansk Industry, the Confederation of Danish Industry, sees China now uh, as, as, a, as a challenger to its competitiveness, uh, particularly China's industrial policy made in China 2025, which could result in lower growth rates and job losses in Denmark and around Europe. Even on security, China has entered the debate in Denmark. Uh, this is particularly the case with Chinese telecommunications giant Huawei and debates over whether it should be allowed in uh, Denmark's 5G networks and what tools uh, China is willing to use to ensure it comes in the Kingdom of Denmark. China's joint military exercises with Russia in the Baltic Sea and the Mediterranean have also caught uh, officials' attention here in Denmark. So the instinctual reaction in Denmark and I think in other places in Europe is to flee to the safe spaces of the China relationship um, when faced with these challenges. And uh, green energy and sustainable energy might be one of those safe spaces and we'll see we may see the comprehensive strategic partnership that Denmark is set to sign again to renew with China this year focusing on, on these areas. But one hopes too that this partnership will also focus on rules and norms in the relationship and how to deal with challenges when they arise because challenges have persistently arisen, uh, rose up in the last several years. We can't forget too that, that Washington does not make Denmark's job of dealing with China any easier. Uh, it's both Beijing's behavior and pressure from the United States that are closing these safe spaces that once existed with China. Both countries are challenging European interests and values. Both are pushing us to decide who are our enemies and who are our friends. So we may on occasion, I think, need to make binary choices on our policies towards China um, and consider how they advance our interests and values. But I think in Denmark, in, in, in research and in journalism and in politics, we need to do a better job of unpacking where European interests and values are and how they compare to Chinese, American or other positions. We need to sort of promote rules and norms instead of promoting who are our friends and who are our enemies. So today we're, we're gonna, we have a great panel um, from different parts of Europe that are gonna look at some of the critical issues that other countries uh, and the European Union is facing with China. Um, China is really going to be in the spotlight this year in Europe. There are three or four big high-level political uh, summits and events planned in Europe and in Beijing. Um, it's certainly in the Danish news. Uh, so I'm really happy to, to, to have this panel with us today. They have exceptional knowledge on, on various aspects on China. So I'm going to introduce uh, just the, all the speakers now and then, then we'll get going with, with the three talks. First, we're going to hear from Lucrecia Poggetti, who is an analyst at the Mercator Institute for China Studies in Berlin. Uh, she works on EU-China relations. She's focused on this special forum China has with Central and Eastern European countries, 17 plus one group. She works on uh, Beijing's public diplomacy in Europe as well. And she helped launch uh, Merck's uh, new forecast on China just uh, last week or two weeks ago in Berlin, where uh, they surveyed 150 uh, China experts and practitioners around Europe about their opinions about where the relationship is headed. So I invite you to check that report out, along with Merck's and Lucrecia's other work. Next, uh, we have Torsten Benne, uh, who is co-founder and director of the Global Public Policy Institute in, in Berlin as well. Uh, his research spans uh, German and European politics, uh, data and technology politics, and the interplay between the, U the U.S., Europe, and China in global order. Uh, Torsten is writing uh, for German newspapers and, and international newspapers, and, th and last week he wrote in foreign policy about Britain's recent decision to give Huawei uh, limited uh, access to its 5G networks. Uh, Torsten and Lucrecia also were part of a group of researchers who wrote a report um, entitled Authoritarian Advance, which looked at China's rising political influence in Europe 
which you, sh you should also check out uh, online, or uh, the library can also help you find it here. Finally, uh, we have Maya Nowens, who's a research fellow uh, for Chinese Defense Policy and Military Modernization at the Inter International Institute for Security Studies, London. Uh, she, she covers cross-state relations and East Asian geopolitics, um, focusing on a number of areas from PLA modernization to Taiwanese politics to China's pursuit of leadership in emerging technologies and what the implications are for Europe. And she co-authored uh, an article on that latter subject uh, just last year. So plenty to read, but right now we're going to jump to our first speaker, uh, Lucrecia, uh, who's going to talk about European China strategy. Great, thank you so much. Um, I've unmuted this, I hope you can hear me. Um, and thank you for the kind introduction and invitation. It's really great to be here. And Copenhagen is becoming ever more interesting for uh, China watchers across Europe. Um, I will indeed be drawing from the results uh, of the survey that Luke has already introduced, um, which was part of a forecasting exercise that we conducted at Merix by gathering the opinions of about 150 European China experts and practitioners across Europe from different sectors, industry, governments, think tanks, civil society. Um, but before I do that, I would like to quickly look back at 2019 to get a sense first of where we currently stand on European China policy. Uh, 2019, to put it as Macron did, is the year that marked the end of naivety on China, if not across the whole of Europe, certainly in Brussels and in other European capitals like Paris, Berlin and increasingly Copenhagen as well. And uh, this uh, new realism, if you want to call it like that, is visible in a few initiatives uh, that came into being last year. Uh, one is the adoption of a foreign investment screening framework, uh, which was adopted very quickly by European, by EU standards, and this is going to come fully into effect in October this year. Another one is the coordination work that the EU has done on 5G risk assessment across Europe, which led to the recent publication of a toolbox uh, on 5G risk mitigation. And both initiatives were taken with China in mind, and specifically the Chinese Communist Party and its influence, its ability to influence the behavior of Chinese companies abroad by making them act accordingly with uh, Chinese Communist Party strategic goals. And last but not least, obviously, uh, the strategic outlook that the Commission put out in March last year, just before the uh, last edition of the EU-China Summit, which obviously is very well known for calling China a partner, a competitor, a systemic rival. But at the same time, more importantly, it's strategic in the sense of taking into account the political and the security dimension of the relationship with China. Uh, which is something that is not real across the board in Europe yet. Uh, as Luke also mentioned, in some European countries, and including in Denmark until recently, China was primarily looked at as an economic player without really acknowledging the geopolitical implications that relations with China can have. So this has started to change quite drastically in 2019. And it's indeed quite interesting uh, by looking at our Merix uh, survey to see that most of respondents think that political issues have now indeed come to the forefront of Europe-China relations and they add to long-standing economic issues. Uh, for the most, uh, the agenda between the EU and China is very heavily an economic agenda. Uh, but now political issues are equally important. So we asked in our survey which uh, in a number of issues is most likely going to strain EU-China ties in 2020. And the majority of respondents put uh, Beijing's politically motivated retaliation against European governments and companies as number one, followed by the long-standing issue of restricted access to the Chinese market. Um, so I think that's quite telling of a reality that we bring with ourselves in 2020 and probably for even, for even longer. And it might indeed reflect those kinds of issues that have become more visible across Europe in different European capitals of Chinese embassies, ambassadors, being quite pushing correct in the political views of individuals, uh, journalists, researchers, politicians, whose views on certain issues are different from the visions of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and uh, it's perhaps not surprising based on that, uh, that about less uh, than 10% uh, of the respondents of our survey see any prospect of improvement in either economic nor political relations with China in the year ahead. But what is more interesting is that about 59% of respondents predict a deterioration in political relations with China this year 
At the same time, about 53% of respondents think that economic relations uh, are going to remain stable. So uh, one might argue that Europeans want to have the cake and eat it too. Uh, but actually, by looking at the case of Sweden, for example, uh, this seems like a realistic scenario. And this is something that we might be facing uh, from 2020 onward. Um, as you all know, uh, diplomatic relations between Sweden and China have been worsening mostly over the Gui Minhai case, the illegal detention in China uh, of Swedish citizen Gui Minhai. Uh, but so far, this hasn't affected trade and investment relations between the two countries, uh, despite continuous threats by probably the most vocal Chinese ambassador in Europe. But there are different scenarios that European countries might find themselves in this and in the next few years. Uh, and one of the examples that I find quite interesting is that of the Czech Republic. Um, so a country for which retaliation might not be an issue at all. Uh, you might remember that recently uh, Prague City Council decided to terminate its sister city agreement with Beijing. Uh, because of the one China principle being included in the agreement and decided to replace it with Taipei. Uh, and the general assessment there was that actually, despite the threats, there was not much to lose in economic terms. Uh, the Czech Republic, together with um, a lot of other Central and Eastern European countries, have been part of the originally 16, now with Greece, 17 plus one framework uh, for cooperation that was created by China in 2012, with the promise of bringing more investment uh, to the region. But this has so far not really materialized to the point uh, that the president of the Czech Republic, Milos Zeman, who has been very keen, who had been very keen uh, in promoting closer political relations with China as a means to open up economic opportunities uh, has announced that he won't attend the next iteration of the 17 plus one format to show his discontent with this investment let down. And I think we can draw another lesson um, as European governments uh, for the year ahead uh, or the years ahead uh, from the case of the Czech Republic, uh, which is that uh, the assumption that forging closer political ties with China is no shortcut to business. The assumption was that these would create special treatment and economic benefits, but that's just not a reality. And it's something that uh, another country, uh, Italy, uh, recently experienced as well. Uh, Italy signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative in March last year, specifically with the idea uh, that signing on to signing this document, which is essentially a political uh, document, would have created goodwill and would have hope opened the Chinese market to more Italian exports. Now, actually, China um, de declined uh, over the course of 2019. So this is also working as an eye opener in the country to realize that there really, this uh, idea of getting close to China politically is no shortcut um, to business. And then there is another scenario, and that's uh, the scenario for countries like Germany, uh, whose economy has grown uh, more dependent uh, on the Chinese market. And uh, to these countries, the threats uh, made by uh, Chinese officials might look much more real. And this is something that we're currently witnessing, for example, in the Huawei debate, and Torsten is going to uh, talk about that. Um, where uh, China apparently uh, sent some veiled threats about potentially hitting German car exports to China. And um, I think the Hu Huawei is really going to be a test for Germany, not least because uh, last year Germany together with France promoted themselves as the drivers uh, of a more coordinated uh, European China policy. And Germany's credibility as a leader in driving this effort is going to be determined also by how it reacts uh, to the 5G debate and whether it can show to the rest of Europe that it can act strategically without being uh, mostly uh, confined uh, by short-term economic interests. And indeed, from our survey, there came out quite some skepticism about Germany's and France's ability to take the lead on a unified China policy. And in fact, quite some skepticism about the prospects for cooperation effectively between the EU and China uh, in the year ahead, including on those stated goals that Yulk has already mentioned, like uh, climate change, for example. Um, and it's interesting perhaps to contrast this skepticism with the narrative that picked up towards the end of last year about China making 2020 its year of Europe. 
Um, you might remember that in November, around November, China appointed its first special envoy for European affairs, Ambassador Huan Bo. And then in December, Wang Yi was in Brussels. And he specifically said that Europe is high, is a priority on China's diplomatic agenda. And last year, China also promised that by the end of 2020, it would sign a very ambitious, comprehensive agreement on investment with the European Union, which is something that we've been discussing now for a few years. So the expectations are quite high, and actually uh, the comprehensive agreement on investment in particular is high on the agenda for the Leipzig summit, an extraordinary EU-China summit that's going to happen on top of the regular uh, EU-China summit, which the German, the, the German officials are currently organizing and which will take place in September during Germany's presidency of the Council of the EU. And the idea for this summit is specifically to provide a platform to get to the signature of the bilateral investment treaty between the UN and China, but also providing a platform for all the 27 now EU heads of state and government um, to meet with Xi Jinping uh, by basically trying to make the 17 plus one framework uh, irrelevant and unnecessary. Uh, but things are not going so well for now uh, because uh, China has actually upgraded the 17 plus 1 framework. Uh, so Xi Jinping should be taking over chairmanship directly from Li Keqian this year. We'll see now because it was supposed to take place in China, but obviously uh, the coronavirus crisis might affect this. And then on the comprehensive agreement on investment, uh, EU officials have been complaining about negotiations moving very slowly. And uh, Business Europe in its recent report that came out about two weeks ago, warned against rushing into a bad deal and stressed once again that we need to make sure that we prioritize substance over timing. And in addition to this, uh, the signature of a first phase trade deal between uh, China and the United States also takes some pressure off uh, the Chinese leadership to pursue better relations with its European partners. So I would argue that we shouldn't make too much out of this statement that China is going to make 2020 its year of Europe. And instead, we should be focusing on sharpening our own policy responses. Um, obviously, getting the 5G issue right is going to be quite crucial, not just by implementing at the member state level uh, the toolbox uh, that came out recently, uh, but also by working towards a real European technological sovereignty. And something interesting that the Huawei debates across Europe have exposed is the fault lines that are currently putting in our government's short-term economic interests and long-term strategic considerations at odds with each other. So this is something that European governments will need to address sooner rather than later. And uh, a good attempt to try and bridge these two has been made by the Netherlands, for example, by coming up with a couple of task forces. Uh, one is called an Economic Security Task Force, uh, which investigates issues like Chinese investment in the country and also uh, the potential involvement of Chinese actors in the 5G rollout. And another one is a specific China task force that pulls knowledge from different ministries with the idea of coming up with a coherent strategy, a strategy on China that is coherent and linked up across policy domains. Um, obviously, as I said before, this is still not a reality across the whole of Europe because there are member states that still focus primarily on China as an economic player and on the potential of the Chinese market rather than looking at the political and security dimensions as well. So closing knowledge and perception gaps across Europe about China is going to be fundamental in the years to come if you really want to work towards a, co a cohesive European China policy. And uh, perhaps Leipzig uh, might actually provide a platform to do that. And I think the uh, lead up to the summit is going to be just as important as the summit in itself uh, because it might provide uh, a framework for EU member states to talk about China at working level and coordinate uh, and exchange their views. And finally, at the EU level, uh, if we want to be uh, geopolitical in our approach to China, uh, as uh, von der Leyen has promised to make her commission uh, in the next years, uh, we need to expand the work that we're currently doing. Uh, so far, we are uh, dealing with the China challenge mostly by working on our trade defense instrument. Uh, you'll know the debate about the overhaul of the competition policy and also potentially revise uh, public procurement rules. But I would argue that we also need to complement this with external policies if we wanted to, to be geopolitical and with policies that include the value and the normative dimension of relations with China as well. 
Uh, we currently have two initiatives uh, that uh, we need to further develop uh, in this regard. Uh, one is obviously the connectivity strategy uh, between Europe and Asia that the EU launched in 2018. So now it's the time to make sure that uh, we provide substantial funding to make that a reality. Uh, and that should happen under the next multi-annual financial framework, which is going to run from 2021 to 2027. And the second one, which is a good initiative, you might remember in December, EU foreign ministers agreed uh, to work towards the creation of a sanctions regime uh, targeting human rights violators. So uh, I think there are a few elements. We've come a long way and there's still quite a lot of work to do. Uh, so far, we have been really good at describing mostly the China challenge. In 2020 onwards will be the time uh, to act. And I'll conclude here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lucrecia. That's excellent um, overview of, of the diff some different countries' uh, relations with China and to point out um, sometimes our assumptions on our economic relationship with China can be quite off uh, reality. So, but we jump now to, to Torsten um, uh, on Germany and Huawei. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's uh, wonderful to be here. It's my first time in Denmark, uh, hard, hard to believe, and it's always great to be on panels and be able to learn from Lucrezia and Maya. I'm not a ch Sinologist or China specialist, but I work on issues uh, of positioning ourselves uh, on, on problems that uh, have to do with the party state and uh, wi with, uh, with China and uh, 5G, as Lucrezia said, is encapsulates uh, many of the dilemmas we're facing uh, right now. And uh, you put it very well. Uh, are we able to act strategically and uh, put long-term issues of technological sovereignty and our security front and center, or do we cave and put short-term economic uh, interest uh, at the center? That's the, the question, the Huawei debate. And Luke, you framed this event uh, as, you know, in 10 years, I think in 10 years we will look back uh, and the 5G debate in Europe and Germany and in, in Europe will either be the moment where we woke up uh, and uh, said that technolo technological sovereignty is not just an empty shell but something that we mean or it's, it's the moment where we kind of completely gave up. As, as Europeans and uh, resign to the fact that we uh, either need to be dependent on the US or on China or on, on both on key future technologies. Uh, 5G is a luxury, we're in a luxurious situation. I think it's the only key technology uh, where we actually, we as Europeans have two champions with uh, Nokia and Ericsson that are global leaders on this technology. We don't need to beg others uh, to uh, to provide us uh, with technology and yet uh, we have a very hard time coming to terms with uh, with this decision. For me the you know the choice should be clear. Uh, 5G is absolutely vital critical infrastructure uh, so there are huge security implications. Uh, why would you make your if you have your own companies uh, that can provide the technology and that are in a very unfair competition with uh, champions uh, with uh, with champions of uh, Chinese state capitalism uh, Huawei and uh, and and ZTE why would you make yourself uh, dependent uh, on on a on a Chinese company for critical infrastructure if you uh, want to kind of protect your long term technological sovereignty that means the industrial base that we need to have in order to have viable uh, viable technology leaders and that uh, Nokia and Ericsson will thrive in the future and that uh, you don't open your front door to sabotage and uh, and uh, espionage uh, risks. So it should be a no-brainer. We should have kind of been able to deal with this Huawei in or out question very fast and move on to other questions uh, that Maya will be will be talking about that will be much more difficult, uh, I think, uh, on on other key future uh, future technologies and the dual risks, uh, dual use risks uh, we, uh, we have to we have to deal with and other technologies where we don't as Europeans uh, as of yet have the technology uh, have the technology ourselves so we should have been able to deal with this Huawei in or out question uh, 
fast, moved on to other issues because uh, to just to keep Huawei out doesn't make your network secure. You need to do a lot of other things. We should focus on that. And we should focus on how to ensure a quick uh, rollout of uh, 5G technology because uh, those who, and I, I believe that those who will kind of roll this out fast, uh, they have fast mover, uh, first mover advantages and uh, will reap rewards uh, later later on, uh, but uh, we haven't been able to. We were as as and uh, as Germans uh, and German government, the whole public debate. We were awfully unprepared for this debate uh, when it hit us uh, in in 2018. The lack of preparedness I find. Uh, staggering on all sp all parts of the government, but also on my my industry, think tanks, researchers, and in, 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 in terms of being prepared and having the necessary data at uh, at hand, uh, I, f I find quite uh, quite uh, remarkable. Uh, where do we stand in the debate? Uh, on the we have a camp that's led by Chancellor Merkel and. Uh, her economics uh, minister Peter Altmaier that is very aggressively promoting a Huawei open door policy and uh, Chancellor Merkel wants to avoid uh, shutting Huawei out uh, at any cost uh, and for a long time it looked like she would get away with uh, with this uh, she last year uh, tasked or the government tasked uh, the German National Cybersecurity Agency and the German Net, uh, uh, Network Agency to come up with security guidelines. Uh, and when they were published in, in September, it would have meant that uh, Huawei had free reign in the in the uh, in in uh, terms of providing 5G technology. The only thing Huawei would have needed to do under these uh, regulations would have been to provide a self-certification of trustworthiness. That that was uh, that was the way for the for the regulations to deal with non-technical political uh, political risks. Uh, that. And that's the positive side of the debate uh, caused a revolt, uh, like not a revolt, because Parliament uh, is a bit ridiculous to say that it's a revolt in Parliament because Parliament should be making uh, making laws. But it it caused a backlash uh, within Merkel's own party uh, with her coalition partner, the, S the Social Democrats, uh, and uh, so right now. It's 50-50. It's very hard to tell where the decision uh, will be going, uh, where it, it's going. Merkel's own party, at for the time being, is uh, is split. Uh, the kind of rebellion against letting Huawei in and against the policies uh, that Merkel promotes is is led by the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Norbert Röttgen. And uh, they ha they will decide next week or the week after on and th the parliamentary group and it's uh, right now it's open whether uh, which side gets gets a majority or what kind of compromise will be brokered. The interesting thing is that the social democrats, which are often vilified in the international press for being sellouts to Putin on ga on Gazprom and, and and so on, they actually uh, they actually came up. Uh, with the strongest position on 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 Huawei and uh, 5G, they c uh, they passed a motion in the parliamentary group uh, that very clearly says that all companies that are under the influence of a foreign country that is not governed by the rule of uh, rule of law uh, should be excluded from all parts of 5G critical infrastructure. And it also very much highlighted the industrial policy and uh, European technological sovereignty uh, sovereignty concerns. So th they they have a very strong position, and uh, the only party that is supporting Merkel's position right now is, <laughs> funnily enough, uh, the former communist left party. So she finds herself in bed uh, with the former communist left party, which for kind of anti-American reasons uh, and, uh, and and so on, at, at least they find uh, the Americans as, as bad as uh, the, the Chinese and they 
they think this is all a sinister plot. Uh, many of those in the left party s think it's a sinister plot by the Trump administration and uh, to kneecap uh, China and that we shouldn't be shouldn't be part of it. But uh, the both the Green Party, uh, the then the far right AFD, and uh, the economically liberal Free Democrats, uh, they're all for ex excluding high-risk, uh, non-trustworthy Chinese uh, providers from German 5G critical infrastructure. That's quite an interesting development. But right now it's, uh, it's completely open where this debate uh, or where the parliamentary decision uh, will, will end up because uh, Merkel is uh, you know, throwing everything she has, it, it almost seems, uh, in toward the end of her uh, reign into, into this uh, and uh, trying to make sure that uh, Germany doesn't move to uh, to ex exclude uh, Huawei. Now it's interesting to look uh, at uh, at the reasons uh, that uh, that uh, different actors that are pushing for an inclusion of Huawei give give for this. A lot of it, uh, and uh, that's a, a sad state of affairs. Quite a bit of it uh, is is kind of wrong infor information. The Prime Minister of Bavaria, that has <coughs> two of the uh, two of the most, uh, or th actually th uh, no, two of the most uh, important German car makers, Audi and BMW, in his state, he actually claimed that we don't have European companies uh, that can provide uh, the, the technology. And in the old days, the good old days, we would have relied on a Siemens network, but no longer uh, Siemens is no longer available, and uh, so we we need to make. Uh, unfortunate choices uh, i mean his reasoning is uh, has to do a lot with uh, with the car industry and i'll come back to that but i find it quite surprising or like quite remarkable that a prime minister of uh, one of the <coughs> most prosperous german german states uh, kind of uh, uses uh, the wrong information that we don't have european providers that can can provide us with 5g uh, 5G uh, te technology that uh, Huawei wants wants in. You don't need to explain. That's uh, the the good right of the company to fight for that uh, for an inclusion in the European market. What I what but what I do find remarkable is how many academics or research institutes they find that do their bidding uh, for money, and uh, that that actually is quite. Uh, quite remarkable uh, w across Europe. Ox uh, the Oxford Economics uh, has kind of led this kind of cottage industry of doing pro Huawei reports uh, by uh, that are paid for by Huawei. There is a German version of that uh, that the consulting arm of one of the most important uh, research in uh, economic research institutes uh, in Germany, DIW provided on how wonderful the innovation footprint of Huawei is uh, is um, in 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 Germany and uh, you need to ask yourself why one of the most reputable German economic research institutes uh, that gets a lot of government funding accepts money from a company that's complicit in uh, repression in, in Xinjiang to provide a report uh, that actually sings the praises of, of, of that company. That I do find uh, remarkable. Another important player and making, making arguments about uh, that it would cause a lot of delays uh, to exclude Huawei and that it would be a lot more expensive and some are also arguing some of uh, some are also arguing that uh, Nokia and Ericsson are behind in terms of uh, the technological race with Huawei is the uh, tele telecommunications companies the operators uh, Deutsche Telekom Telefonica and uh, Vodafone have all been extremely vocal pro uh, in favor of Huawei in, in the German debate. And I think that's partly self-inflicted uh, on the part of politics because uh, according, uh, like we've used the kind of time-tested model of squeezing uh, the network operators as much as possible in the spectrum auctions and then we wonder that they want to go with the cheapest technology because they don't uh, run any kind of national security uh, you know uh, risks uh, and uh, that's not part of uh, part of their 
calculation that they just want to use the cheapest uh, available uh, technology to protect their bottom line that's already quite uh, severely threatened by the by the licensing fees they need to uh, need to pay for the for the frequencies for the spectrum and uh, so it's quite easy to understand that they would be pushing uh, to include Huawei what i don't find so so uh, so easy to understand or uh, what i find quite daring is that they 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 tend to use a lot of wrong information on the kind of delays it would uh, it would cost uh, how much more it would cost to exclude uh, Huawei but uh, that they are kind of pushing for Huawei i can it's it's not very hard uh, it's, it's not very hard uh, to see why then you have the german national cybersecurity agency that uh, works very much with an IT security mindset, uh, which also has its legitimacy. If you're an IT security expert and you only look at it from an IT security perspective and not from a national security perspective, vendor diversity is actually what reduces uh, what reduces risk. And there's a lot of merit uh, to it. Uh, and indeed, uh, there's a limited uh, amount of, of vendors uh, available that do full service uh, 5G. Uh, in, ad in addition to Nokia and Ericsson, Samsung is coming into the market. But there's there's uh, right now, since the push for open uh, open RAN standards hasn't been uh, very successful, there's 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 not that much uh, additional full service uh, providers or c companies that come in for parts uh, parts of the 5 uh, 5G value value, cha uh, value chain but uh, these uh, IT security professionals uh, of course they don't see the national security risk they don't want to take this into account and BSI also has a bureaucratic politics interest in in including Huawei because they've just started uh, a test center with Huawei in, in Bonn and they see themselves as the new kind of GCHQ like uh, agency that uh, does intensive testing and gets a lot of additional stuff so it's not so hard to understand why they would be pushing for that. A little harder to understand is why why somebody in government uh, like Chancellor Merkel would be willing to kind of uh, trade uh, long-term national security interests uh, for l allowing Huawei in. And uh, for me, it's also I, I don't fully understand uh, why she's pushing so aggressively for this. Uh, I think it partly has, has to do with, uh, with the fact that she doesn't think uh, we can antagonize China at a situation where, where Europe and Germany is also being attacked by the Trump administration on on trade issues, so that I can understand, and uh, I think for the rest is a lot of fear of retribution. Uh, that uh, one 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 uh, that she 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 is afraid of Chinese retribution if we were to exclude uh, Huawei on on. Uh, and its immediate effects on the political relationship. She wants to end her tenure with a very successful Leipzig summit. Uh, Merkel has invested a lot in, in her ties to China, has been to China more than a, a dozen times during her tenure, and she wants this Leipzig summit in, in September to be a chance to shine, and uh, she doesn't want to, uh, that Leipzig summit to be one where she picks up the pieces of a failed, uh, failed China policy that just... Uh, uh, was was driven uh, or like a China policy that just hit hit a hit a wall, but mostly I think it's uh, the the fear and you hinted at that of retribution against German uh, against German against German companies. Uh, Germany is quite unique. When we wrote this study uh, about uh, Chinese influencing political influencing efforts uh, in in Europe across Europe two years ago. My concern was mostly with smaller European countries that are easily influenced, Greece, Hungary, uh, or in Portugal, where you, b where you were buying uh, a major electricity b provider, or the, the port, uh, like in Greece, gets you quite a bit of uh, political leverage already. But I was, uh, I think what I personally overlooked at, uh, at the at the time, and I think that's playing playing out, and is of course playing out in, in plain sight, is uh, the leverage that comes 
with uh, being uh, being dependent uh, on the Chinese market. And uh, Germany is uh, unique in that sense that uh, we have we have Siemens, we have BMW, we have Volkswagen, we have Audi, and uh, all these companies are incredibly dependent uh, between 25 and up to 35, 40 percent of their turnover is in 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 China. A recent uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung article, I think, very rightly said that Volkswagen no longer is just a German company; it's also a Chinese company and i think that's uh, that's the reality and uh, with with that comes a lot of political dependence or dangers of uh, political dependence and i think that's uh, what some german industry leaders who are pushing uh, for a soft line on on huawei in the 5g debate what they have in mind and i think that's partly also what chancellor merkel has in mind uh, that uh, we don't you know in a situation where we're facing you know an adverse U.S., a, p a possible economic uh, downturn, we cannot afford to antagonize uh, China and uh, risk retribution against uh, major, major German uh, German companies. Uh, I personally, and then I'll end, uh, I'll end with uh, with that. I personally think that's a valid concern, but I think for two reasons, uh, it's 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 dangerous. Or like for the for one reason is uh, one reason or like uh, let's I mean it's dangerous for one particular reason is that what what is the signal w that we send to Beijing if we give in now on a vital national security interest uh, after the ambassador has quite openly threatened uh, Germany not to exclude Huawei that's the signal we would send is we're in your pocket uh, you know you have leverage uh, over us. And uh, this will only go downhill from from there because uh, Beijing will know that they can uh, they can they can squeeze us and get us to do things that are against our national interest and our core security interests just because we're dependent on on the Chinese market uh, so much. So that's that would I think be a very dangerous. Uh, very very dangerous uh, signal to to and self defeating signal to send uh, it's also quite open and we should can talk about this whether some of the threats of uh, retribution are also credible against the german car industry most german german cars in china are actually produced in china in joint ventures uh, partly with state owned companies so uh, hurting German cars uh, in 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 China, you would need to at least do in a very targeted kind of way that the high-end luxury cars that are still produced mostly in Germany that you would target target those uh, and let the bulk of the production that actually happens uh, in in China untouched because otherwise you'll also hurt your own company. So some of the threats of retribution they're they're not a hundred percent credible. Plus if the EU were to act as one, and that's the point of this, we're a formidable economic power. We can especially in a in a situation where China has its its, its own worries and uh, economic worries, if we stand united and say like uh, if you you know retribute against any country and uh, company and, and so on will kind of do the will do the same I, I think we don't uh, we don't need to be to be afraid uh, and uh, we can we can uh, we can stand uh, we can stand on our, our ground in this and I think that that should be a more positive message that if we actually 5g could be a positive story for europeans if we said we, we want to be leaders in this we have we have two of the global leading companies we want to be leaders in the rollout we'll do whatever it it takes to be actually be ahead in in this in this race we create you know we regard uh, fi uh, 5g as kind of public infrastructure that uh, we need to roll out uh, we need to roll out fast that could actually be a very positive uh, message to also our citizens and not just this whole d uh, debate that is only defensive and so like should we can we afford to leave Huawei out or not but to actually set our sights higher and and not be so afraid uh, of uh, of retribution for as as you said uh, Lucrezia if actually Europeans are able to be united and uh, Germany has a pivotal role to play play in uh, play in this 
then uh, then we can actually have a credible chance to in ensure our uh, technological sovereignty and uh, also deal with the more complicated issues that uh, Maya will now talk about uh, that uh, will haunt us, I think, in the coming decade. Thank you. Thanks so much, Thorsten. And um, I'll jump right to Maya now uh, for the, the last talk before a, a small break. <laughs> Thank you. So from defensiveness to defense, I guess. Um, so my name is Maya Nouns. I work at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, <laughs> and I focus uh, mainly on uh, Chinese military um, operations, Chinese military modernization efforts, and that's a little bit of what I'm going to start about uh, talking today. So I'm going to introduce you to what's happening in the People's Liberation Army at the moment in China, uh, why that matters for Europe. Then I'm going to talk about um, how China is pursuing high-tech dominance and what that relates, how that relates to defense and security, um, and again, why Europe should care. And then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about how all of this affects um, norms and rules as well in the international rules-based order with relation to defense. So on the first point, the PLA is undergoing a massive change under President Xi Jinping since uh, 2015. There's a new military strategy. Um, there are three goals that are set out for the PLA to achieve. It, by 2020, it needs to be a fully mechanized uh, military, so that's mainly looking at the ground forces. Um, by 2035, it, ha 35, it has to be a fully modernized military, um, which means it's up to par with capabilities in the region uh, related to in comparison with the United States, for example. And by 2049, it needs to be a global leader, a top tier military that can fight and win wars. And all of this, of course, is situated within the great China dream. You can't have a strong country without a strong military, according to President Xi Jinping. Um, so this is the path that he's laid out for them. Uh, the 2020 goal, by the way, does not look very positive at the moment. Mechanization, basic mechanization of making sure that uh, the army has main battle tanks that are standardized across five different regions of um, theater, combat theaters, are, is woefully behind. Uh, a goal of connectivity and information-based, networked-based um, uh, goals within the military is also behind. So at the moment, uh, things are a little shaky. But again, that 2035 goal is really important to keep in mind. It's a regional goal, not a global goal. Um, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact on us in Europe, of course. Um, the reorganization has uh, an ambition to make the military more efficient and more combat ready. The military in China hasn't fought a war since 1979. And that means that um, they lack experience. Uh, they don't yet know how to integrate modern capabilities. Uh, they need to practice increasingly to focus on these new domains of operation, focusing instead of on the land, looking towards the sea, the air, cyberspace, and outer space. Um, and all of this is happening at the same time when the military is being reduced in numbers. Um, there's a pull for more skilled talent. They're trying to improve the reputation of the military in China to make it um, something that's more respectable as well, um, rather than a last resort. Um, so these are difficult difficult goals for, for them to achieve, um, but with a lot of political will behind it, of course. And lastly, uh, on the modernization bit, is that this also affects industry in China. So the biggest supplier of arms to the Chinese military are state-owned enterprises at the moment. Um, so about eight conglomerates. And these have been focusing on uh, delivering conventional capabilities, platforms and systems, planes, missiles, ships to uh, the People's Liberation Army. In the past, we thought that these were really outdated, really bloated, inefficient companies um, that weren't able to innovate. This is now changing. Uh, last year, a colleague and I, uh, Dr. Lucy Borosudro, conducted, uh, well, created a new methodology to uh, assess how competitive these Chinese state-owned enterprises that have defense products are. And in fact, when you list their defense share of revenue uh, in, a, in a global top 100 list, all eight uh, are shown in the top 22, and one is in the top five of global companies. So we can talk about US primes like Lockheed Martin, um, but right up there is a Chinese SOE as well. So. Who cares about this? China is far away. The military doesn't really operate here. Why should we really care that China's military is modernizing? Um, well, one, um, 
I want to say that China, of course, has an ambition that might be normal. Uh, it sees itself as a great country, wants a great military. Okay. But added around that are concerns around capabilities as well. It seeks to gain experience not only in the Asia Pacific, but also in our backyard. So we've seen uh, live fire drills, anti-submarine warfare drills in uh, the Mediterranean and in the Baltic. So this is no longer a question of China, oper the PLA operating only in its own neighborhood, but also closer to home. Um, furthermore, um, there is a question of political signaling, of course. China doesn't have alliances, but in these joint operations and joint drills uh, with Russia primarily, there's a signaling to Europe that we uh, have a backup here. Uh, and second of all, uh, there's the question of how the PLA will be used in the future to protect Chinese interests further and further away from home. So how do they... Uh, how do they protect investments in the Belt and Road Initiative um, in countries that are increasingly, um, I suppose, more unstable? Uh, will the PLA be used for this or not? At the moment, we don't see that yet. We see that private security companies, uh, Chinese private security companies are used. Um, but will this change in the future? And if so, when? Um, China's power projection capabilities in conventional terms also threatens Europe's friends and allies in the Asia-Pacific region, so that's something to really take in into consideration. And furthermore, as I talked about the Chinese uh, defense industry, this is not only supplying the PLA, but Chinese uh, arms ex China is becoming an increasing arms exporter, uh, not just in small weapons, but also in increasingly sophisticated platforms like heavy and armed uh, drones, UAVs. Uh, and these will now operate in areas where our militaries operate in our neighborhood. It means that um, because of China's lack of an export co control policy uh, regulation, that these, um, these platforms and systems could be proliferated beyond their first uh, end sale. So there are, there are follow in consequences here for our militaries as well. So now moving on to China's uh, pursuit of high-tech dominance. Well, the focus here is, of course, on emerging technologies. What I've talked about before were conventional capabilities, and um, that's no longer just the case. Uh, China seeks to transform its economy, moving away from basic production uh, manufacturing to added value, higher value uh, manufacturing. Um, Regu rec recognizing, of course, that there is an economic challenge within China in the long term, a demographic challenge in China in the long term. And so this transformation of the economy is an important uh, consideration under President Xi Jinping. To gain the upper hand in these technologies, uh, China is pursuing a dual track approach. So incentivizing domestic innovation, but also continuing to leverage foreign technologies and research and development as well. Uh, there's a recognition that while state-owned enterprises in the civilian sector were useful and did a good job to a certain extent, uh, that's innovation in certain technologies that might be important in the future are not necessarily their strengths. So there's a recognition that China now needs to look more towards its private sector, which has been burgeoning. Um, small startups to mid-sized companies to large-sized companies to national champions, of course. Um, and there's a toolbox to make sure that these technologies that China is pursuing, things like um, artificial intelligence, quantum computing and encryption, automation, robotics, blockchain, uh, again, cyber and space technologies are, um, are becoming the main centers of uh, technological dominance for China. So this toolbox includes things like uh, at the very top, top-level policies uh, and targets, both nationwide and regional uh, in these areas, um, provisional financial and tax incentives for companies and strategic sectors, um, creation of innovation hubs according to core areas of technological interest, improved conditions for easier uptake of their technologies in the domestic market to test and to learn what works and what doesn't. But of course, as I said, and the reason why I'm talking about this is that these technologies don't just add to China's civilian economy, to the improvement of China's domestic economy and tech sector. They have future warfighting uh, uh, capabilities and pos potential as well. So really what we're seeing here with the technologies like AI and quantum uh, robotics automation is this blurred line between civilian and military uses. Um, 
And what it, of course, means is that uh, China, again, has a policy that very cleverly seeks to leverage the Chinese economy in these areas called civil military fusion. That has now been made a military, s uh, a top national strategy, which means that whatever happens in the civilian sector has the potential to flow to the military sector. Whatever happens in the military sector could spin off into the civilian sector in terms of tech use. Um, again, so what? China has a tech rise. Um, this was nothing to do with us in Europe. Uh, economically, of course, that's untrue. The unfair competition um, that the United States has referred to also has consequences for European companies, as my co-panelists have already talked about, in terms of the level of support um, and market access in China that Chinese domestic companies uh, receive. And in terms of security and defense, European technology has also already contributed to China's improved capabilities, particularly when it comes to things like robotics, uh, we talked about mergers and acquisitions and joint ventures. Well, uh, China has spent a significant amount of foreign, foreign direct investment to, um, uh, to merge and acquire uh, European companies that have strengths in things like robotics, particularly in Germany. And China has launched in 2016 the first quantum satellite in the world. Well, where did that technology come from? Actually, that technology came from Europe as well. Um, there was an Austrian researcher who had gone, who had approached the European Space Agency for funding to uh, investigate this project. Uh, he didn't receive the funding from the European Space Agency, and at the time, he got a message from a former PhD student of his, who was a Chinese professor at a university in Beijing. And suddenly, um, he was brought over, and uh, finances were made free for him to pursue that uh, research and development. And in the end, um, China launched a first quantum satellite. Again, quantum is still a very, all of these emerging technologies are still very unclear in how we're going to use them in defense. But there's clear scope for, for use there. And a lot of different countries are investigating how, where, and, and what might be possible. So the same with the quantum satellite. Um, Another advantage that I want to talk about is um, access to data. So Chinese, technolo uh, Chinese technological companies don't only have uh, a clear advantage when it comes to testing their products in China and improving on them, they also have unbided access to data in China, data flows that they can use in order to improve their algorithms for things like artificial intelligence. But the other thing, of course, is that China is uh, developing, as we know, um, a um, policy of centrality in the global ICT sector, which means that if the backbones of technology and, and, and information communications technology around the world um, become Chinese, we don't also have uh, questions of standards and, and, and uh, espionage, but there's also a question of where data flows go and are collected and are processed. Um, and if all of that happens in China, theoretically, that data could be used again to train algorithms um, and to improve Chinese development of emerging technologies. Again, both as civilian consequences, but also for use in defense. Um, and so uh, that access to global data is something that European companies don't really yet have. And that is, again, an unfair advantage that we'll face in the future. Um, so I would actually argue that although China is behind, perhaps, in certain areas of technology, on par in others, um, working on slowly edging their leadership in things like quantum, overall, the Chinese are not really in a bad place at the moment when it comes to their pursuit of dominance in emerging technologies when compared to the Europeans. This whole of government approach simply leverages everything that they have and throws it at these problems. Um, and the consequences for Europe here is that the nature of these technologies really will make it difficult to control research and development, as well as product outflows to China. Um, and for us to really maintain our competitive, innovative advantages within Europe and strengths at home. Companies and governments, uh, to my, uh, in my opinion, and despite the progress that's already been made in Europe, are still ill-equipped to face this challenge. Um, business opportunities still weigh considerably in decision-making at home. Um, the EU has made improvements by introducing an investment screening mechanism. Um, member states have investment screening mechanisms, and if they don't, they have to build those into their legal systems. And dual-use export controls have been firmed up. Yet, 
all of this at the EU level, whilst fantastic, in theory, is still not obligatory and legally binding. That is up to member states. And so it's up to member states' ability to assess incoming foreign direct investment from China, to assess the risks to uh, not only their national security, but European security and uh, critical infrastructure, and also to assess whether their dual-use technology exports to China are uh, under fall under the EU categories or not. So I think a lot of work needs to be done on making sure that all of this is cohesive, coherent among uh, the EU 27 now, I suppose, um, and actually put into use. And furthermore, it will become even more important as the US clamps down using CFIUS on its exports to China and inflows of investment from China, that this redirection of trade, Chinese money will go somewhere, doesn't uh, comes increasingly towards Europe um, and thus makes the need for this type of coherency and rigor even more important. Now lastly is the challenge that I mentioned of norms and regulations in the current rules-based international system when it comes to the uh, conventional capabilities of the Chinese military but also in terms of emerging technological uh, capabilities. Um, on the conventional side, in the South China Sea, China doesn't just um, project its power and uh, coerce or intimidate other claimant states using the PLA Navy. There are rules and regulations in place for how navies uh, conduct operations and encounters at sea. Uh, what it doesn't cover, however, is how navies might operate, respond, consider interactions with merchant vessels, which operate as um, a maritime militia under the PLA, and under the command of the PLA. And secondly, uh, the Chinese Coast Guard, which is the second line of defense uh, before the PLA Navy even gets involved. So in China, there's a, by the Chinese uh, government in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea, there's a three-tiered, a three-layered three um, uh, method of power projection that current uh, legal and procedural and uh, normative frameworks don't yet cover. Um, second of all, if China is to be a leader in AI and emerging technologies, what rules and norms do we have in place for this? Um, there are, as we said, differences in norms and values with China in how we acquire data, in how we store data, in how we use data. Um, there is no solution here yet. There is no legal framework. So how do we uh, how do we build this? Should we build this? Can we build this? Um, if we already consider certain norms, uh, GDPR being one, um, how do we implement that? And how do you maintain that? How do we ensure that this is a more global effort and not just one linked in, uh, in Europe? So where do I see this going ahead? Um, I think that we can expect an increase in Chinese presence, militarily speaking, conventionally speaking, around the world increasingly over the next decade. But I actually don't think that China's priority will be to send all its Navy ships to Europe. Um, until 2035, China has plenty of problems within the region that it wants to solve. Uh, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and of course the question of Taiwan. That will be its core area of interest militarily uh, until that is resolved. Um, but that of course doesn't mean that um, we won't see increased presence. And what do we do when we encounter increased presence is also the question. Um, Second of all, if the United States focuses more militarily on East Asia, the Indo-Pacific in particular, what does that mean for European security? We have to think about how we burden share with the United States if different areas of operation become uh, a priority for one or the other. Um, and thirdly, it also means that from now on we can't really diverge the, uh, the questions of economics and uh, security anymore. These two are uh, two sides of the same coin and they really can't be disconnected. So the way that we think about these issues has to really change. It's no longer that military is just an aircraft carrier. Military can also mean emerging technologies. It can also mean the uh, information that flows through your smartphone camera, uh, surveillance technologies, uh, automated driving, things that seem innocuous and not a problem suddenly have military value. So we need to rethink the way that we uh, think about security at home, but also the way that Europe can play uh, a more increasing security actor uh, role abroad. Thanks. Thanks so much.
Thanks, Maya, and, and thanks to the three panelists. We'll take a, a short break around. All right. Um, we're going to start up the Q&A because we, we want to get um, all your questions, uh, as many as we can, in the next uh, half an hour or so before noon, um, taken care of, um, and, and make uh, the best use of, of all the speakers we have today. Um, and uh, so I'm going to try to maybe just take you know, two or three uh, questions at, at a time to try to bring them together. And uh, if, if you may just sort of um, tell us your name and y your position or institute, uh, if you're uh, affiliated with one um, before uh, your question, and, and, and please try to keep uh, questions uh, re s focusing on, on uh, something you want to ask the panelists. Um, and uh, we look forward to hear from you. So uh, any questions, just please raise your hand and I'll try to mark you. We got one to start off and a couple more there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vigo Fischer. I'm a former member of parliament. I have a question uh, to the last presentation about the Chinese military. Mm -hmm. And uh, my simple question is the following. Can, can China afford this incredible expensive foreign and security policy. One of the last things we read uh, in the international news is that uh, China is now in the future controlling 20% of the shoreline of Cambodia with an incredible uh, expensive airport which the Cambodians probably never will have any benefit of. And, and so China is continuing all the time and it's and the navy expansion is incredibly expensive. One of the few domestic critics in in China, an old professor who probably thinks that he's so old that they won't do anything to him, he 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 said last year, "Don't throw our money in Africa, when people are so poor at home." All right, we had a, a lady up front, just here in the front row, another one. Thanks for your question. Hi, I'm Michelle Rasmussen from the Schiller Institute. And in your speeches, you try to counterpose economic cooperation and what you call geopolitical uh, strategic interests on the other side. But we actually have a different idea. In fact, after the uh, killing of the Iranian general, uh, the head of the Schiller Institute came out with an idea of having a immediate summit meeting between Xi Jinping, Trump, and Putin. And then Putin came out also extending that to the UK and France as the permanent members to try to uh, prevent geopolitical confrontation. And what we're saying is that also the economic development needs to be a part of that, including more cooperation between Europe with the uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, and including uh, development of economic development in the Middle East and in Africa. What about economic cooperation as a strategic uh, a way of lessening strategic conflict and building up uh, uh, hope for the future in terms of eco economic cooperation. Thanks for your question. Um, it's a good one on interdependence. Why doesn't that build up cooperation? Uh, man, the man in the middle here, um, in the glasses, if you just put up your hand. The yeah, please. Thank you. Um, Jan Lemnitzer, formerly uh, Center for War Studies, SDU. I've got a question for Torsten Benner. Um, would you like to enlighten us a bit more on the technical argument about the core versus uh, periphery argument around 5G? Uh, because that is what the debate increasingly is turning around. Is there such a distinction? Can that be made? And uh, to give one example, is there a risk that um, we exclude Hui from what we perceive as the national security core of 5G, but a company like a major German car maker will set up its own 5G network, for example, with uh, Hui components. Um, and uh, to what extent is, is Boris Johnson right that this distinction can be made and it's okay? 
to let UI into the periphery. If you could elaborate a bit on the technical side here. Thanks for another one. Another good question. I think that's enough to uh, to grapple with, um, and then we'll take some more after. Uh, Maya, did you want to deal with the um, uh, to, to talk about the if China can afford this this military buildup? Um, also, I mean the servicing of of this military and servicing of infrastructure going forward. Yeah. Um, so I think one needs to make a distinction here between whether you're talking about military modernization, so the buildup of the PLA and the Belt and Road Initiative, which is what I think the other part of your question was about. So with regards to the PLA, um, the Chinese defense budget, according to IISS estimates in the higher ranks, and of course we don't know the real uh, number here because there's clear lack of transparency when it comes to the different budget lines included in this uh, military budget and spending in China, um, is that would be over 200 uh, billion US million US dollar billion US dollars um, so still a third of you know what the US uh, presumably spends um, the Chinese in their latest defense white paper have said that their spending is adequate and in line with their defensive needs um, but of course this number encompasses as you said expansive shipbuilding perhaps um, a massive number of uh, personnel um, research and development would need to be part of that defense budget as well. So there's a question of how big is that number really? Second of all, uh, uh, what's included, what's not included? Um, but also how do we calculate this? Because, um, you know, do we use US dollar constant figures? Do we use renminbi figures? Do we use um, PPP adjusted figures? Um, because what China builds and constructs and researches within China uh, adjusting for um, PPP rates is not the same as uh, the, equi the, the equal in another country, right? So we need to take into account cheaper labor costs, et cetera. So it is perhaps true that the Chinese can do more with their money, get a bigger bank with for their buck than what other countries in the West can do. Um, now, I actually don't think that the defense budget is... Um, a massive amount of uh, percent of GDP in China. So it seems that whilst it has grown in absolute terms, the rate of growth has slowed down in the last year by a fraction, so 0.6% uh, as a percent of GDP, which suggests that if the economy slows down, there will be an effect uh, to a certain extent on how much China spends on its military. Um, so I actually think that it can still afford this going forward. Um, in terms of can it afford its uh, foreign policy expansion, namely, as you mentioned, the Belt and Road Initiative, I think there are questions within China, as you rightly stated, as to how much money has gone into this project, which has in you know, arguable, arguably become a branding exercise for things that were part of the Belt and Road, uh, planned and were not. Things that were pre projects, investment projects that predate the Belt and Road Initiative have a label of Belt and Road Initiative put on them. So I think we're not quite sure how much money has gone into that. I don't think the Chinese are even sure how much money has gone into this project. Um, and I think that at the moment, because of this criticism that we saw um, in China, even in the margins, uh, there might be a reconsideration and a slowdown in the Belt and Road Initiative to try to consolidate the projects that are uh, already in place to make sure that they're economically viable going forward because no country can, not even China, can afford to keep throwing money into projects that see no return. Um, so I think this is something to watch going forward. Thanks. Lucrecia, did you want to tackle this question of why economics hasn't or doesn't bring us together? Um, sure. Yeah. So I understand it as a question put in basically against economics and uh, geopolitical confrontation. So more economic cooperation, if I understand you correctly, instead of geopolitical confrontation. And thanks for your comment and your question. And in fact, I would be very, very interested to know more about the Schiller Institute's work uh, on and with China. Um, so uh, that the uh, that Europe has an interest in cooperating with China, and there's no doubt that China has an interest in cooperating with us. Neither of the two is going to go away anytime soon, so this is more about smarter engagement rather than confrontation. 
Uh, there are issues on which uh, China is a key partner for Europe. Uh, we know that we need to collaborate uh, on trying so far and successfully, mostly because of the United States on uh, the Iran nuclear deal or on issues like climate change mitigation, uh, WTO reform and, and more. Uh, having said that, uh, we can't disregard geopolitics because it's simply a reality. Uh, we realized, I think back in 2016, there was a big watershed moment for the European Union when we really started to see uh, the geopolitical effects of China's investment in the region and the fact that some of those investment, not the entire of it, not, entire, not all of them, uh, but quite a few being basically state-led investment. There was a big case with KUKA in Germany uh, of uh, Chinese state-led investment basically acquiring a major robotics firm. Uh, and there was a case of uh, the EU being unable to issue a strong statement uh, to condemn China's behavior in the South China Sea. And uh, that was the result of uh, a couple of countries, in particular Greece and Hungary, uh, who decided to push to uh, water down the statement that the EU was preparing as a whole uh, because they were concerned about upsetting China. So economic cooperation, it's something that we are all, Europeans and Chinese, interested in, and we should do more and do better, uh, playing by the rules, obviously. Uh, but uh, geopolitics is simply a reality that we cannot uh, disregard. And when it comes to economic cooperation, Belt and Road obviously is a, has become a big topic in Europe too. Uh, and uh, obviously there's an issue also of making economic cooperation effective uh, and uh, this also brings up issues related to level playing field, for example, not just in China, which has been an issue for a long time, but including in Europe. If you look at Belt and Road uh, projects here, we've had quite a few issues related to the project simply not abiding by EU rules. Uh, one of the major BRI projects in Europe uh, was uh, the Belgrade Budapest Railway. The Serbian side of it was built because that's outside of the EU, it doesn't have to uh, abide by EU regulations. Uh, the Hungarian side wasn't built. It was blocked by the EU Commission, uh, if I remember correctly, back in 2016 because of an investigation that basically found out that there was no public procurement process. Uh, there was no um, transparency in this process. And there's another case of unfair competition when it comes to BRI projects. You might remember one of the latest uh, 17 plus one summits took place uh, in Croatia. Uh, and against the backdrop of a very symbolic location, uh, which is just where the Palizak Bridge was built. The Palizak Bridge uh, connect uh, basically uh, the, uh, an island to the mainland of Croatia and that was built uh, by Chinese workers, by a Chinese SOE. Uh, and uh, it ended up being funded with about 80% of EU funding. But being uh, created by being done, being carried out actually by a Chinese SOE with Chinese workers, so not really creating jobs. Uh, and uh, actually, an Austrian uh, company uh, then sued the Croatian government, making the case that that was a case of unfair competition because uh, you basically had European private, actually private companies, and Chinese SOE competing on the same terms, so playing by different rules. So I'm all for economic cooperation, but let's make it work. Uh, by the rules. Thanks. There's also a, a, an EU Chamber of Commerce report, um, Chamber of Commerce in China report that recently came out um, that you should look up on on uh, Belt and Road Initiative and, and how European uh, companies have and all other foreign companies have have been sort of left out of mm -hmm. many of the projects and and don't have sort of access to yeah. the financing that China is offering. Um, um, so, next question is on, on these debates about um, um, Huawei um, and, and engagement in 5G network and some differences of, a, uh, of, of perspective across sort of uh, between Australia at least and, and, the, and the UK and, and Germany and other countries about uh, the security implications of that. It would be nice. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Jan, for your question. It would be nice uh, in a good way out if we could say let's secure the core and uh, let's use cheap available technology from Huawei and ZTE and uh, other high-risk providers uh, for the access network, the non-core. Uh, unfortunately, at least to my understanding, 
that doesn't uh, that doesn't work. It's the reasoning by the UK government uh, why they they claim it's possible to control the risk within the access network, and they capped uh, the Huawei share at 35 uh, percent. But they said like these 35 percent uh, we can control. At the same time. If you read the technical reasoning of the UK government, they say that sensitive functions are not no longer just in the core; they are also in the in other parts uh, of the network. Uh, so that means you need to take extra precaution there. As, and this is only the start in 5G. More and more kind of computing power will move to the non to the edge uh, of uh, of the network. And I don't think uh, we can control the risks. Uh, that uh, relate to s to software updates uh, that c that for example that uh, come with that and uh, i think any question a british user or citizen should ask is how does the government decide uh, wh who's you know which citizen has to rely on the 35% that are provided by huawei and uh, which is classified as a high risk provider by the uh, by the uk government and uh, who are the the seven uh, the 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 rest uh, the 65 percent that uh, can do uh, can enjoy uh, a less risky uh, 5G autonomous driving experience uh, with without high risk providers. That's also what I ask in Germany because the German government. Uh, for fear of eavesdropping mostly a uh, long time ago said that the german uh, government's uh, communications network uh, would be built just on european technology uh, and because they said it's too risky to do otherwise and uh, if in the future my health my my uh, my my driving uh, depends on on 5g i would want the same level of protection that german government officials afford themselves uh, in their own communications as a as a citizen, so I don't think this core core edge or core non core core access network the, the distinction works in terms of uh, management risk. You one final point because you mentioned company networks, and that's a very interesting question that we haven't talked about uh, much because uh, actually the f the the start of five G rollout will be a lot of kind of company networks, and uh, we haven't talked much about uh, the choices that these companies make uh, because we could end up with a regulation that excludes uh, Huawei and ZTE from kind of uh, public uh, telecommunications network and companies because they're they're pressured uh, because of their 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 stakes in in China or because they want to go for the cheapest or whatever they decide to go with uh, Huawei so that's something i think we should uh, should be looking looking at as a separate aspect of this debate that hasn't been uh, hasn't been in the focus uh, enough thanks I, I mean th the core is essentially everywhere if you want 5g to 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 work to its fullest potential I think is is, is another way to look at this core periphery debate um, uh, and I mean uh, on on Huawei too I mean w you know how did it achieve this this you know large-scale price competitive advantage against uh, competitors like Ericsson and Nokia and Samsung um, you know Europe has dealt with this before with uh, Chinese solar the Chinese solar industry um, around a decade ago and had the very similar types of challenges and and today um, I think sort of the last big German solar uh, power company recently sort of went bankrupt and the Chinese are really dominating that industry so Europe has went through this before um, but it seems the stakes are are getting higher on security and um, uh, industrial uh, competition. I already have three more questions. Um, first, the, the gentleman just right here in the front, and Mike's coming to you. Uh, Anna Storstrom uh, retired, and to Lucretia in particular. Um, you were talking about the European China strategy. Uh, uh, we are looking for a Danish uh, China strategy, perhaps moving away from. China, uh, panda hoggers only, where we have, I mean, in our policy, have looked at the export, 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 5%, perhaps in the future, I don't know what, uh, and that seems to have paralyzed. So Denmark have played a lot of interest in human rights, but mostly in Venezuela and so on, and have human rights, something we apply to some countries, not to other countries, and uh, that's a typical thing. But then, 
often in Denmark we have said, what can we do, a small country? I think we should do both trade and uh, push for human rights, but also Europe the European Union is the only place that can do something. And that's so totally right. But as it was mentioned before, when uh, Greece and Hungary and Portugal are uh, sabotaging and paid agents for China, so to speak, then uh, the European Union is not the key. So what kind of recommendation would we give to Denmark? Thank you. Mm. Great question. I had uh, another question, the man in the jacket right here. Uh, my name is Jan Rimau. I'm a psychologist. Um, I have a simple question, but uh, so, sort of hesitating put, putting it. In short, where do we find the research on de-escalation? With examples, for, for example, from China, but uh, it's also a main question. De-escalation, it could be with uh, during intervisibility in military effort, for example, intervisibility into the uh, Cooper aspect, into the business aspect, into the development of technologies. Uh, also, the key concept could be that uh, intervisibility or what we call transference building of that, building of trust instead of building of treats. Where is the research on that? Mm. Good question. I, I had a gentleman here um, in the shirt, just right up here for an another question for this round. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Uwe Wilke. I'm from Denmark. Uh, I have, uh, you have been talking a little bit about Balkan. Uh, I would like a few more comments on that subject because I'm going to Kosovo uh, on Friday, uh, a security study about uh, European Union and NATO. And I've been uh, at a meeting with the Croatian ambassador in Denmark about uh, Croatian presidency of uh, European Union, uh, talking about, for example, Albania and Macedonia, should they join the European Union? So. I just want uh, a few comments of uh, Europe and China and Balkan. What does it what does it mean, uh, for example, for security if we get more European members from from that area? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we're going to take up these questions. Um, the first uh, question, Lucrecia, did you want to, mm -hmm. please? Sure. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the situation that Denmark is facing, I'm afraid, is very common across Europe of how do we balance our economic interests, but we also care about freedom of speech uh, on our territory and abroad and human rights and how do we deal with Xinjiang? What can we really do? Um, it's a very difficult one and uh, Indeed, uh, the EU is the only place, but actually in the past, uh, including on human rights, EU unity has been spoiled because of the same mechanism. China being able to leverage the access to investment opportunities or to threat and retaliation, and then basically countries deciding to uh, avoid, abstain from certain votes. Um, a debate uh, that has been flowing around uh, is basically moving beyond uh, unanimity votes at the EU level so that we can get those um, statements across uh, and resolutions uh, passed even without a full majority, basically. Um, and another debate is that of minilateral cooperation. Uh, so there is, I think, a general sense that European countries obviously have different uh, interests, including vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, so it's going to be necessary, even if it's not exactly uh, the best option for the EU, not to act as a whole, but to have smaller groups that coordinate on some specific issues. Uh, and I think it will be important for the EU to basically assess which, what is really our strategic interest in the longer term and act towards that. Because also for now the strategic outlook is an action plan. We have a few ideas, mostly about economic issues and three more, talking a little bit about climate, uh, so non-tradition and then more traditional security. But really a strategy is something that comes from a very specific goal that we have to keep in mind and moving towards that target in the long term. 
Um, I also want to make the case, though, for a stronger European unity actually coming from the results of our survey, uh, of the Merrick survey that I talked about earlier. Uh, apparently, one of the results uh, that the respondents gave was the case for uh, much stronger coordination. So, people, as the respondents of the survey, forecast that in 2020 the majority of uh, EU member states will draw closer, closer to the European Union. Uh, and interestingly, uh, actually, the uh, the other three options were Russia, China, and the United States. And uh, there's not a huge difference between uh, the responses given for China and the US. And I think that's another crucial point that we need to keep in mind also when we make our own risk assessments and strategies vis-a-vis -vis China, because there tends to be, I think, um, a tendency in Europe to frame every debate about China as uh, or we are being squeezed between the US and China and we have to pick sides. Uh, this sometimes makes us run the risk of overlooking genuine risks. Uh, for example, in the Huawei debate, that's something that I've heard in different European capitals. Oh, we have to ban Huawei or do something about Huawei because the US is asking us to do it. No, you need to take measures that are suitable for your own national and EU ideally interest because uh, of genuine security risks that apply. So forget the United States in this case. Um, so this is again to make the case for uh, stronger coordination at the European Union level and obviously the experts and the practitioners that, that, that we surveyed in our uh, forecasting exercise are not representative of what EU citizens think. But it was interesting to see because obviously we tried to uh, have uh, representation from across Europe that even the more Eurosceptic governments, I think, are starting to realize that in this ge changing geopolitical landscape, getting close to the EU and working together ultimately is what we need. Uh, I mentioned before, again, on human rights, uh, this initiative that the EU foreign ministers in December agreed on, which is basically coming up with a new Magnitsky Act a human rights sanctions regime. And that's something that we can do all together. Not all the member states are super happy with it, obviously. But again, uh, if we, uh, we talked about this before, do things together, then also the, retal the, the power that China has, the leverage and the potential for retaliation diminishes substantially. So that's something that we need to do and also thinking potentially at the policy level of some mechanism for use solidarity for when these kinds of things uh, happen. Thanks so much. The question on uh, is, what what do we know about you know how we can de-escalate uh, the tensions that we've seen risen in the last couple of years on China? Does anyone want to uh, give that a try? I, I can sure. talk about it a little bit from a defense perspective. I, I actually don't think that there's not any research. There is research being done on this at the moment at various think tanks, not just um, obviously at Merrick's, but in the UK and in London particularly, but also in the United States about increasing visibility of an understanding of what's going on in China from a sober fact-based perspective and thus thereby helping clear-eyed policy making. Um, there's increased reporting on Belt and Road Initiative projects and how those are developing or not, um, what the impact on economies are, positive or negative. As Lucrezia mentioned, there were some examples already. Um, there's another think tank in the United States who's doing very good work on um, using satellite imagery to talk about gray zone operations in the South China Sea on behalf of the Chinese government, um, which is very important. Not everybody is able to access this data, so making that publicly available is very important. Um, and of course, the IISS is also contributing to this with the Military Balance Book and the Military Balance Database, whereby we have um, an inventory of um, the military's uh, capabilities around the world in terms of platforms and systems and personnel. So I think all of that enhances visibility and understanding, fact-based visibility and understanding, but you're talking about trust building, right? You're talking about off-ramps, and for off-ramps you need trust. And for trust you need intervisibility, as you <coughs> rightly said. So if one side is not willing to share information um, discuss certain topics because they're deemed too sensitive, um, then I really see that as a difficulty. There is a, there is a challenge there. When we talk about things like China's defense budget, um, the clarity that's given is not necessarily clarity at all. Uh, there are still a range of questions as I highlighted as to what includes, uh, what is included in the Chinese defense budget. And um, I will be publishing uh, very shortly a paper, a scoping paper on what that might entail. But 
again, there's very little uh, response and willingness to actually talk openly and frankly, I think, uh, on certain topics that are deemed too sensitive. And I, that's, a, that's a major hindrance. Yeah, please. Just, <coughs> just to, uh, to add to this, I think trust building, de-escalation, yes, across societies, uh, across citizens. So we need to, as geopolitical tensions mount, uh, we need to invest in exchanges and dialogues uh, on the trans-societal level. That's not very easily done with a system that is tightly controlled, but I think you can do it and we need to double down on, on these kind of investments to understand uh, and to build bridges. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I don't think uh, you can just say trust, trust needs to come out of some somewhere and you need to we need to locate ourselves uh, uh, in, in terms of where we are. And in German, we have this term Systemwettbewerb. Uh, we are in a competition of systems, not with Chinese citizens, but with the party state, with which is this authoritarian high-tech state capitalism that uh, they're pursuing and uh, liberal market, e liberal democratic market economies. We're in this uh, competition of systems, uh, economically, politically, and also ideologically. There's an excellent article by the former director of Merck's Sebastian Heilmann in the Berlin Policy Journal, uh, the latest uh, edition, that actually describes uh, his take on this uh, competition of systems or this systemic uh, rivalry and only I if we understand what we're up against and how we can be competitive in this competition of systems i think uh, then we need to be firm we need to be competitive we need to kind of f first of all also plug some of the weaknesses in our own system that are ailing us and dividing us mm -hmm. as uh, societies and uh, we need to develop a forward-looking uh, vision in terms of where we want to go how we want to shape the future and then from a from a position of confidence and uh, and strength we can engage uh, with uh, with the party uh, with the party state uh, but trust doesn't come out of uh, doesn't come out of nowhere we need two sides uh, for that uh, and uh, de-escalation uh, without uh, a partner on on the other side uh, that is not an option i think uh, we can pursue in this competition of systems that the last question of that series was on on balkans and and um, sort of the near neighborhood um Lucrecia, is that something you want to comment um, on? Sure, a couple of points are on what the main debate surrounding the bulk, the Chinese presence in the Balkans is, especially for those uh, countries that would like to access the European Union. Uh, one of the main concerns has been the fact that for now, these countries obviously don't have to apply uh, EU rules. And uh, the concern is that because of the lack of transparency, for example, with BRI projects that we've been talking about, um, China's presence in that sense might not help them in accessing the EU because obviously they will need to meet certain uh, requirements about rule of law, transparency and so on and so forth. At the same time, there is a case to be made also for the European Union to change its approach. Uh, and part of this should be done, for example, when we actually get to implement our connectivity strategy. Uh, I mentioned before this was launched, I think it was October 2018. Uh, and we've been talking about it, we've been signing uh, documents, uh, doing high level fancy fancy events about it, but now we really need to implement it and uh, we need to make sure that we give substantial funding under the next uh, budget. And uh, in addition to that, it's not just a question of funding, it's a question also of prioritizing areas of geopolitical interest to the EU. So the Balkans obviously will play a huge role in that. And in addition to giving uh, funding for the initiative, uh, we need to speed up our processes because what these countries often complain about is that it's impossible to get EU money. It's so uh, time consuming. So uh, we need to basically speed up our processes and make sure that we make the funding available more quickly. Um, and then there is another case. I'm not the best person. Uh, I don't know, Maya, if you would have something to say about Serbia. I don't want to. Uh, I'm just aware of uh, some more like military level cooperation, Chinese drones, something that Maya has already mentioned in her presentation before. So also how we deal with uh, China as an arm exporters basically. And uh, the fact that there are quite substantial engagement as I understand uh, as a non-expert on the issue with Serbia uh, and that's uh, also going to be crucial for how basically we handle security in our very close neighborhood. Yeah. Thanks. 
there was one more question. We'll take it as the last question um, for the day uh, as we're running out of time slowly. Um, just, uh, just right there in the co corner there. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. So John Nicholson, British Embassy. So this is, isn't actually a question. It's more a response to the question about core and periphery that was uh, okay. raised earlier. <coughs> I think core and periphery, core and edge are sort of terms that mask a bit more complexity. So that binary masks a sort of bit more complexity in terms of how you think about 5G telecoms networks. So I think in the technical analysis that Torsten referred to, I think we, the, Nas the UK's National Cyber Security Centre, um, breaks it down into five, I think it is, sort of, sort of uh, parts. And for those parts, you can think about them separately, you can get your arms around them, you can think about how you secure those different parts separately. So that's the, the, how I would sort of characterise that. And, and I think we have to think about what the sort of imp implication is of this argument that if kit from a high-risk vendor is deployed on one part of the network, it leaves the whole of the rest of the network vulnerable. Well, that means you haven't built a very resilient network, for starters. But it also means that sort of more, I suppose, conventional cyber attacks, that would, that would be the same case. If you got into one part of the network, the whole network is, is exposed. So we just don't accept that sort of argument uh, with regard to, to 5G networks. We think you can think about different parts of the networks and their security in different ways. Well, you know, going back to the, the point about um, sort of the, each country making their own decision based on what's best for their security, this is what the UK has done. There was a rigorous technical analysis informed by expertise on both telecoms and cyber security, which we published, we've been very transparent about it, there's been a lot that's been published out there, um, which sets out the reason for the, the approach we take in, which suits what the UK needs in terms of cyber security. And going back to the point about sort of intelligent functions moving to the edge, Yes, that can happen. That can be how you design networks. The sort of mobile edge compute is what, what people talk about. But it's not, you know, it's not inevitable. It's not clear even that the, the use cases for that are here yet. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, if you do that, you're moving intelligence part, intelligent part of the networks out to the edge. And so that becomes the core at that point. So I, I think, you know, let's think of it in, in more conceptual terms and sort of, a, I suppose, um, I suppose sort of, um, sort of topolo topolo topographical terms. Um, and just as a final point, I would, if, if people are interested in this, I would encourage them to go to the UK's National Cyber Security Centre's website. There's a lot of information there. There's a blog from the NCSC's technical director. There's 30 pages of, uh, of, of security analysis we, we've published. So there's a lot of information people can, can go to to understand the decision that we made. Thanks, thanks very much. I think Torsten has a quick follow-up. No, and, and I commend the uh, National Cybersecurity Center for laying out this case. It's a very intelligent uh, document. Uh, I think, in fairness, we have to say that the uh, that Ian Levy says this is a UK solution for UK context, and no other, uh, barely any other country has the technical capabilities that you need to yeah. actually do the risk uh, risk mitigation that uh, the UK government sets out to protect itself against the risks of Huawei. And I think it's a very intelligent document, but I think at the core this was a not a technical decision. Let's not fool ourselves. This was a political decision by a UK government that after Brexit thinks it cannot afford to antagonize China, and that's why it, it needs to be it needs to have Huawei in in there. Uh, and uh, there's a nice technical reasoning that was also helped by the fact that the UK indeed has a long track record of dealing with risk mitigation uh, strategies with uh, Huawei. But uh, I do think at the core, this was a political decision. And uh, I would always say, let's, let's build a network that, that uh, is already secure for future intelligence uses because you doesn't the UK wants want to become a leader in 5G and uh, prepare for all the eventualities of having the most intelligent uses of of these networks and I think we, we need to build uh, and we need to take this into account that we want to kind of milk this technology to the to the to the maximum for our own economic benefit and uh, let's not wake up uh, in five years uh, and say, oh, all at once it became intelligent and now it gets hard to control this, uh, this beast. That's what some in MPs, including Ian Seeley, who uh, has ex expertise also in this, have been, uh, have been arguing. Now is the time when we can decide it. And I think, it's in fairness, it's a 
good technical argument that Ian Levy sets sets out, but at the core it was a political decision, and even the technical uh, sides in terms of future risk, you can see, d uh, you know, reasonable people can disagree on that. Thanks so much. We'll leave it there for today. Please join me thanking the panel for this wonderful contribution today. Thanks. And we will have another China-related event next month, so please keep an eye out for that.